Hi, Hello. everyone. Welcome to Fantasy Labs. I'm Pete. I am Jeremy. Pete, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing all right. You? Not too shabby. Hello, chat. Hello, everybody hanging out. Um, we're very excited for today's today's topic for Fantasy Labs, uh, where we're going to be talking about the mythic Odysseys of Theros that just came out. Pete, have, uh, have, have you had a chance to, like, dig through a ton of this book yet, or...? Um, I have dug through uh, not much more than what we are talking about. Today. <laughs> the part we're going to talk about. Uh, yes, uh, but yeah. I have dug through those thoroughly, uh, and I'm, I'm excited to go. And also, I've I've read all of the uh, the player content as well. Uh, and, uh, uh, I'm yeah. looking forward to uh, talking about that at some point too. Uh, but um, I the things that I'm actually the most excited about of it weren't the player content and were the the um, Piety system and some of the new monsters that they uh, that are thrown out here. Some of those magic items are really cool. That's what I personally am most excited to talk about out of this, and that's what we're talking about tonight. Absolutely. Uh, for those who aren't aware, Fantasy Labs, a show that we run almost every, most Sundays, uh, yeah. except unless we have a different show going on, but almost every Sunday we run Fantasy Labs here on the DMD10 Twitch channel at this time, which is 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, it's a show where we talk about all things homebrew for Fantasy Dungeons and Dragons, and in the case of today, not homebrew, official stuff. Um, uh, we're because... looking at it from a kind of analytical perspective, right, on like how helpful and useful is this for us as dungeon masters? Uh, uh, or and, as home brewers, uh, there's no better places to learn from, from and take notes from than what is considered official content. It's kind of the official content is what we base our homebrew around and, and how we tr try and like judge our own work. So it's great to uh, look at it in that context as well, uh, with a critical eye when, uh, when necessary. Absolutely. So I'm very excited to talk about Theros today. This is an interesting setting. So for folks who aren't aware, I'm just going to dive right into it. Theros is uh, the newest setting module released for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, released on, oh goodness, was it the 2nd? I think it was June 2nd. Uh -huh. Um... And it is basically a, it's a Magic the Gathering crossover between Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering. Uh, kind of like when they did the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. Ravnica was another Magic the Gathering setting. And this one is a little different than Ravnica, because Ravnica was very much a Magic the Gathering setting. That's really not what we see here in Theros, right, Pete? Um, that is... Um, that is true. But it is a uh, magic epic setting, but I mean, Theros is of course a uh, is of course an MTG setting, uh, and there's tons of references to that, uh, both in the pantheon that they describe, and some of the monsters are specific to Theros, uh, and, it, and it interacts with that Theros. But the thing about what makes Theros beyond that is that it's a setting very much based in Greek mythology. So, in a lot of ways, the mythic Odyssey of Theros is a way to do an entire D and D book based around Greek mythology. Uh, which, for me personally, was a lot more engaging a read than, say, the last magic setting, which was Ravnica, which was a very magic-heavy setting with a lot of details that were relevant. These are, uh, a lot of the content in here is, I think, a lot more generally applicable to any game, uh, because even games that aren't set in, like, some of the myths of ancient Greece, uh, a lot of games still take influence from those legends in just yeah. kind of every story. Uh, they, they have such a huge impact on fantasy storytelling. Absolutely. And if you're interested in picking up the Mythic Odysseys of Theros book, uh, which again um, is, is out now, is publicly available and released, you can get it anywhere digitally, which I believe anywhere digitally just means D&D Beyond. Uh, I guess maybe if you get it on Roll20, maybe. I'm not positive of that. Or Fantasy Ground, but D&D Beyond is a real place where you can get yeah. this book. Or on July 21st, it will be out in all uh, major local game stores. A lot of local game stores are doing like a pre-order bundle where if you buy it, for, if you pre-order from your game store, you're going to get a code for a copy of it on d, d Beyond or at least a hefty discount. So if you're thinking about buying this book uh, and you want it now, uh, even digitally, highly recommend talking to your local game stores, giving them some support, uh, because God knows they need it right now. And, hell, you can get two products for the price of one, basically. So. Uh, couldn't agree yeah. more. Uh, but um, before we start talking about the actual content directly, um, a lot of the times on Fantasy Labs, we, uh, we're doing kind of critical analysis in the content 
uh, context of our rubric that we use. Uh, we're not going to go over the whole thing, I think, here right now. Um, but we may be citing that from time to time as we go through and, and talk about some of the, the design in this book or, or just things that we like or dislike in this. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and, and post a uh, just going to go ahead and, and post a link in chat to our rubric. So if you're interested in, know, if we reference that at all and you're interested in knowing what it is that we're talking about, uh, that's what we are referring to. Absolutely. Thank you, Pete, for doing so. Uh, and you can, again, check that out on our website, dndtime.stream slash uh, hashtag rubric. So, uh, yeah, let's let's dive right in. So Mythic Odyssey Theorist, we've got the cool cover art up here showing a dope hydra battling a dude with a spear and he broke a statue. It's just all very cool. Uh, but let's let's dive into what's actually in here. So looking at the, the table of contents, I have everything open here on D&D Beyond. Um, there's actually a lot in this book that is very generally applicable, or potentially generally applicable, um, to like any Dungeons and Dragons game, um, unlike some previous um, um, setting related releases for fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, there's a lot of content in here that can be used in a lot of ways. Uh, so we've got chapter one about character creation. There's going to be some cool stuff about, you know, supernatural gifts that maybe could be used elsewhere, some race options, some subclasses, and we're going to talk about those another time. Yeah, well, we may also, I, I think we might dive back into some of the supernatural gifts just for a moment when we're talking about the yeah. system, because those uh, directly interact with that. They do, yeah, that's true. Um, and then those are all just ways to make your character a little bit more engaging i guess you could say or not engaging but give you more to play with um with your character um for uh the second chapter in the book the gods of theros this is a chapter that i thought was not going to be useful at all and because i looked at it i said oh it's a piety system it's only like a page of this write-up but the piety uh, system is actually like everything the whole yeah. way down from piety all the way through the last god you know there's a lot of text in here explaining what these gods are but also an equal amount of it is talking about how their kind of domains could fit into this piety system. That's going to be very exciting to, to chat about and go yeah. through. There's a lot of useful stuff in there. Um, some cool gods. Uh, I don't know. We'll, we probably won't go through like every god, but no. they are uh, they are integral to it. And, and there's a really cool implementation of the, uh, uh, of the piety system in those and like ideas for how you can earn your god's favor more which is something that's always been very kind of vague. Yeah. I, I'm looking forward to getting into that. Uh, it's the thing I'm actually probably most excited about talking about is, is that aspect. Chapter three is, is very much for the Theros setting, right? It's locations in Theros. Um, that could still be really cool for like inspiration. I mean, it, well, since so much of this is based on ancient Greek and Greek, uh, ancient Greece and Greek mythology, I'm sure there are things here that you could very easily riff on and, and use in, in your own settings. Uh, but we're not going to talk about those a ton today. Um, chapter four is creating adventures in Theros. I'm really interested in, in going through all this in a fine tooth comb, but again, not our focus today. Um, chapter yep. five is magical treasures. Uh, I'm very excited to talk about those later. There's some very interesting um, items in, in this book. Uh, and then the final chapter, chapter six, is called Friends and Foes, uh, and it includes uh, a whole bunch of different types of creatures, uh, as well as uh, a bestiary with, with a lot of new, uh, a lot of new monster options uh, and NPC character options for you to uh, play around with, uh, as well as the new mythic monsters, which is a, uh, a new mechanic. Uh, Jeremy was talking about with me a little bit earlier, I guess one that's uh, been kind of almost brought back from fourth edition, uh, but it's really cool. Yeah. I'm excited to talk about that as well. Um, and there's a whole bunch of cool maps that they have just at the end, uh, which, you know, that could be really helpful if you want to just steal a map and repurpose it. Um, so that's what's everything that's in the book. But like Pete was saying earlier, we're going to talk mostly about this piety system, the treasures, and the fiends and friends. I'm sorry, friends and foes today. Um, I'm very, very excited. Uh, also, one quick thing before we hop in, I wanted to say a uh, couple of comments in chat I wanted to go over here, uh, which the first one is a great question from Frosty Pirate. How do you feel about Wizards of the Coast incorporating worlds created for other games into D&D? I have some misgivings, but I can't really put my finger on why. <laughs> Maybe I'm just getting old. Um, that's... It, it, <sighs> it reeks, right, of the, of the corporate corporate inter intercession, right? It's that... that big corporate overlord saying, hey, how about we mix our chocolate and peanut butter 
and sell both our products twice as well, right? Uh, that's how I, I understand that feeling, Frosty. Um, At the same time, oh, Jeremy, finish your uh, finish your thought. Oh, it's weird because, like, I actually, I, I'm interested in what you have to say too. Because for me, I didn't like it in Ravnica. I really didn't like it. I think Ravnica was. Uh, it felt to me like it was a forced choice. I do like it for Theros, though. Um, I'm actually Theros very much is... in, the, in the same boat, yeah. Um, yeah. I thought Ravnica... My thinking is, if it creates a product that is good, uh, it's it's good, and if the product that it creates is bad, then it's just like, you know, the cash grab. Even if Theros is a cash grab, if it's a cash grab because it's a worthy product, then I think that that's great. Um, and D and D has a pretty long history of adopting other settings into itself and kind of taking them onto itself. Uh, I mean, the most notable one well, being uh, the Forgotten Realms is is very much that at its core, uh, which was. I mean, you, you're setting. saying settings, people. Like everything in Dungeons and Dragons was stolen from somewhere at some point. Uh, yeah, I mean that's true as well. Like uh, what they got, the Beholder might be their one like original thing, which is why they're so <laughs> damn protective of the <laughs> Uh Beholders and uh, our Illithids. No, um, illithids are not are not they, the originals at all. The term mind flayer is, and they are also very <laughs> protective of the name mind flayer. Uh, yep. um, but uh, that's uh, that's funny. Uh, another thing and, anybody uh, was mentioning was the new Legends yeah, of Runeterra. Uh, did you look at that at all, Jeremy? I have actually. I saw a little bit of that. Speaking of of two huge things intermixing to try and sell, uh, there's a new uh, what is it? Legends of Ruterra, something of Bid Buildwater uh, expansion that was released on D and D Beyond. Um, it's pretty interesting. I think it's way too complex, especially with some of the subclasses they were doing. You know, I, I they definitely put a lot of effort into it, and I can see, I can tell reading it that someone really loved to do this, right? This wasn't like someone's throw away. So, no one was being like forced to do this. So whoever whoever made that that little module for Riot Games like legitimately really enjoyed it. Like the doing. Wendy's uh, role playing um, game. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I mean, in that way, you know, if you like League of Legends and that's something that's really interesting to you, despite the fact that I think it's overly complex and in a lot of places, especially in the subclasses, um, it might be really cool. I mean, it might be a lot of fun for folks. So I'm I'm glad it exists. I'm glad it exists unofficially. Is how I'm going to put that. Yeah. I don't want I don't want Hasbro going and dipping their feet in cross promotions like that. But uh, to, to maybe that's please. not my choice to make. Uh, to completely summarize my thoughts on a lot of the content, uh, content in there, it seems like it was made by, very much seems like it was made by someone who's into video game design uh, and the design of Champions and League of Legends rather than D&D, which is cool. Uh, I thought that there was a lot of it was fun, but a lot of it didn't like ring as traditional D&D to me. Yeah, it, it, precisely. I completely agree. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, let's thank talk you for bringing it up, everybody. Maybe that's something we'll look at actually in a future in a future week if people are interested. But for now, you want to dive into Theros? I want to dive into Theros uh, most most assuredly. Uh, and the place that we're going to be diving into it is in the piety system. Um, to uh, just be clear, on, so let's start on talking about like what the piety system is. Uh, piety refers to uh, an individual's devotion to their god. Uh, and more so uh, the gods sort of perception of them and how they see uh, whether or not someone who is a, a champion of them and devoted to them is carrying out their will and actions kind of in game uh, and in character. So piety is uh, the way the mechanics of it work is a reward that a DM can give to a player who, if the DM believes that they are embodying the ideals of the deity which they worship. Absolutely. This is something that had existed in the, if not back there because my girlfriend was using it, Dungeon Master's Guide. Um, but it was really expanded upon here and given a lot more concrete, um, both um, framework, but also good examples for a Dungeon Master to, to look at and understand how it's intended to be used. A huge problem with a lot of the stuff in the Dungeon Master's Guide is there's great frameworks in there but there's not a lot of detail as to how they intend for you to necessarily use it. Um, and I think unlike the um, Renown system, which was expanded upon in the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, the last crossover expansion, um, I think piety works really well, right? Because piety has to do with gods and sense of self. 
whereas Renown has to do with an outside organization. Like, if you worked for one of the guilds in Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, the Renown system, like, worked that they built. But if you were, like, free agents and you didn't directly work for that guild, it would be kind of weird that it's like, oh, I secretly did this thing, and the guild likes me more even though they don't know about it, you know? Yeah. But piety kind of dodges that whole bullet because they're gods, right? They, they know about it if you want them yeah. to know about it. They got, um, these, they got omnipotence. Uh, or actually, I think well, they, they, expressly don't don't. they expressly don't have omnipotence in this setting. They have but omnipotence as well as you need it. <laughs> they have lots of omnipotence. Uh, and um, do you want to start talking about some of the things that you get from piety? Well, before we even dive into that, there's one thing I really want to mention. Because right off the bat, it tells you what they think, right? In this, it's a very, what, uh, fourth paragraph, you know, like, what, 200 words in. Um, they talk about what they expect you to do, how piety decides to work. And yeah. that is, as a general rule, you should expect to increase your piety by one during most sessions of play, assuming that you are following your god's tenets. I think that's important to realize, because, like... Because to, to a certain extent, um, the way they describe gaining piety later on actually conflicts a little bit with that statement there. Uh, did exactly. you get that impression as well? It depends on the god, and that's something I wanted to discuss with you as a kind of disconnect as we go through here. But I just want to just point that out, because I think that sentence is so important when we're contextualizing and reading through the rest of this. Um, but yeah, let's, let's talk about what you can get from piety people. Um, um, the piety system, it, it interacts in a few different points. Um, the impression that I gain from the piety system is that you can only really have, it doesn't say this, but it kind of feels like you can get piety from one thing. Do you know what I mean by that, Jeremy? Like you can benefit from piety on one aspect, um, be it a devotion to a god or one of the, um, that are mentioned in, in the first chapter, the supernatural gifts, for example, in chapter one, mm -hmm. uh, or the, uh, like the Leonin defectors uh, that they mentioned can get almost like an inverse piety, which is something that's relevant to the setting uh, and not necessarily indicative of the set system overall. And even beyond that, I really appreciate that they added that, that, hey, if you want to use piety in your games, but one of you or more of your players isn't interested in either following a single god, or if they're not interested in following any gods, here's a way that they can still gain benefits from the system without having to compromise the character they want to play. So I, I really like that that's the second thing they say. Uh, right off the bat, they're starting at a really good point um, saying that. Um, but agreed. yeah, but, um... the big thing is, like Pete was saying, you can only gain the benefits of piety from one thing. So if you follow one god or you don't follow, you know, or whatever. Um, and the whole rule point of it is if you ever switch your god for whatever reason, um, start your piety all different. over again. Yep, reset to zero, start again. So, and you um, gain benefits uh, at certain levels. That's kind of the core concept here. Once you get three piety, you gain a certain benefit. Ten piety is another benefit. Twenty-five piety is a third benefit. And if you get up to fifty piety, so it's probably like, what, a year into a game, assuming you're meeting once a week, uh, you get a, a really big final benefit. And if, uh, if your piety ever goes below the different thresholds, you will lose the benefits associated with them until your piety goes back up. Um, yep. How do you feel about that, like, just conceptually right off the bat, Pete? The ability for a dungeon master to say, hey, you got this thing because you did what your god wanted. I'm taking away your thing because you didn't do what your god wanted. I... That's, that's, that's a huge problem with like previous editions and clerics or paladins here, or whatever. Here's why I like it. <laughs> Which, uh, here, this is entirely an extra optional system that you want to, that is an opt-in thing. Um, I think it's okay for dungeon masters to like take away something that was like a boon that they chose to give a player. And it's not like, for example, I hate when dungeon masters do something like, oh, you did something that was against your alignment as a paladin, you lose your paladin powers. Like, that's the worst. Uh, but this, I think, it's cool enough that the occasional maybe dickish GM that's a little bit arbitrary with it is worth how cool it is. But even beyond that, right, one of the things that expressly mentions uh, right at the beginning, right, is, yeah, you can expect to increase your piety by one. 
But it even says, although the DM decides the amount of increase or decrease, any single deed typically changes your piety score by one point in either direction, unless your action is very significant. Yeah, it goes out of its like, way. I really like that because it, it, it kind of gives that framework for the DM to right off the bat say, all right, I'm never going to just be like, hi, you lose all your piety. Yeah. Right. Um, Even if, if like your character it, accidentally burned down a temple to their god, right? All right, that's very significant. You lose two piety instead of one. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, it and gives you like, a very clear framework. Uh, I like also the... Uh, the implication there, like as a DM, you could also decide, oh, you gain piety because you thought you were doing the right thing. You just goofed up. DM, DM's not going to punish you for goofing up. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of open to interpretation and, and what works well in the story and, and intent uh, and conversations with the player are going to be kind of important on this in a lot of places. Uh, but I really like the, uh, I really like that core mechanic of it. Um, and we'll come back to that idea when it talks a little bit more about how you gain piety for specific gods. Um, and actually, do you want to pop into the first god, Jeremy? Or is there anything else here you wanted to talk about before we... Yeah, I think, I think that's really about it. Uh, so the very first god is Athreos, uh, or Athreos. I'm not um, sure how to pronounce that. Really uh, cool. God... I believe it's technically Athreos. What if it's Athreos? People who play magic call him Athreos. Uh, so... Athreos. Aethrios is the god of passage, and I want to read the first sentence, at least, for each of these gods, to give you a little more context. All mortals are destined to face Aethrios, the river guide, when their lives come to an end. The god of, the, of passage ferries the dead across the Tartrix River, conveying each mortal soul to its destiny in the underworld. Super easy. And actually, it's the third sentence that really gives what I wanted here. <laughs> For most people, Atreus embodies the greatest mysteries of existence, the terror and wonder of life's last moments, and the revelation of one's ultimate fate in the afterlife. So there we go. We get a good idea right off the bat of this guy. This god represents mysteries. This god represents death and the transition of life and death. And if you know a lot about the Forgotten Realms, for example, hey, this, is, this sounds a lot like Kelimbor who is a god in the Forgotten Realms for, you know, could be a grave domain cleric or something like that. This, right off the bat, this god has a very clear analog in almost every other campaign setting that I can think of. Um, I love, uh, before we talk about what Aethrius actually does, can I just talk about one really cool piece of Aethrius lore? That's my favorite thing. That, well, like, my favorite piece of lore I read on this whole section. Uh, it's the a under the myths of Aethrios. Um, there's oh, yeah. Uh, there's sections that involve the myths, uh, and one of Aethrios's myths was the eight exceptions, which he's, he wears eight masks for the eight people that he agreed one time to to not immediately go to death and to go back to life. Um, and because none of them ever came back, he just stopped making exceptions. And he has those as like a personal reminder. I just thought it was a really cool. Uh, I thought it was a really cool detail, and just like there's so many plot hooks in all of this. Like even if you're not running Aethrios, the river guide, if you're running any kind of like River Styx character, a, a Charon, uh, a other River Styx type character that I can't think of, because that's obviously what Aethrios is inspired by. Um, mm -hmm. You could absolutely use that thing. Like now I stopped making exceptions because of these people, uh, and finding them in the world would be a way to like get him to make it. I, don't know, I thought that was a really cool tidbit. There's tons of stuff like that in these. If we did all of them, we'd be here forever, but it's a lot of cool stuff. I recommend checking that out. Absolutely. And a lot of these kind of myths that exist in here, all of the gods have their set of myths, and the myths are mainly intended to emphasize certain aspects of, like, of, of the gods' personalities, right? Um, and their tenets and their traits. Uh, and so Atreus, that, that myth right there is intended to emphasize the absolution, right, of death and the transitions of the afterlife, that you can't, you have to do it. And so that's a very cool, like, if the dungeon master reading this, if you're working on your own campaign setting, this is a really good example of, like, how to make a really good pantheon without going way too overboard, but also without going too little and then leaving the players just confused if that's something that, like, you were very interested in, in doing. Um, and, of course, there's this awesome art for this guy. Very, those uh, masks. You can see the masks right? on him, too. I mean, it's, the art is sick. Um, but um, well, let's talk about 
this is going to be our first example here. Let's talk about all of the different uh, cool. things that they have on all of these. Dive super into it. I just want to say a couple, a couple of things in the chat. Frost Goddess was saying, perhaps I'm weird, but I like having negative consequences to the player's actions. Oh, Frost Goddess, I'm not saying don't have negative consequences. We're 100% in favor of negative consequences to the player's actions. It's just when the consequence is, because in previous editions, um, and at least in, in some in home, at some homebrew tables, the consequence could be like, could literally render a character unusable just at the whim of a dungeon master. And we're just recommending against that, right? Obviously a character losing piety for doing unpious things, um, or the townspeople chasing you out of town with pitchforks and torches for, you know, burning down a, uh, an orphanage or something. That's like, that's, that's good Dungeons and Dragons, right? Is having, yeah. the, having the world react to you. Having the dungeon master react to you isn't good Dungeons and Dragons, wow. typically. Another way of looking at it from my perspective is, is very much um, a question of consequences versus punishments. I like yeah. consequences. I don't like it when it feels like you're just being punished for making a choice that the Dungeon Master like didn't think was the right choice. Um, yeah. And uh, we've been was saying, I also like the thing about this God description is that they're way more open to interpretation. Yeah, I totally agree, V-Bunny. A lot of this, this God stuff is very open to interpretation. They did a very good job in all these write-ups with the myths and everything of being like, these are like stories. Many of them are even false, but it's kind of all ideas and concepts. And you can come up with your own myths if you wanted to run the Pantheon of Theros in your game. Um, or, yeah, I mean, it's just super easy. It gives you a lot of open-ended, uh, open-endedness on it. But let's speak, you want to talk about these champions. Uh, you mind if I yeah. start at the very beginning? Yeah, go ahead and take us away on uh, Atreus' champions. Yeah, so the first kind of stuff they do, right, is they give you some ideas about the alignment, certain classes that might be interested in this, because the core deal here is piety isn't restricted to a cleric or a paladin or a monk, maybe. It's open to everyone. All characters can engage with this piety system, and no characters are punished or rewarded any more than, than others um, for doing it. Um, and of course, based on the, the god that's specifically in here and their personalities and tenets, they'll recommend maybe some classes or do domains and things like that. I would really look at the domains as the biggest thing that can overlap between settings if you wanted to use the piety system in another uh in another setting obviously a god's tenets well they both might be death gods might be different in the forgotten realms versus in this yes. but uh a couple of things i really like off the bat they talk about uh Athreos's favor and because this is a god of, of death and the passage of life and death i really like they gave you a couple of different ways that like your character might have been destined right as like a chosen uh, or a, yeah. favorite uh, a favorite champion of this god. And I really love just the ideas in here, like a family member died bringing you into the world. Like that is a, a dark favor, right? Like yeah. that is how the god of death opted to show you that they're interested in, like that you have piqued their interest, right? Um, there are some other really good ones in here, right? Like you sent a return back to the underworld, restoring a measure of order of the cosmos. So like a, a person that had come back from the dead. Um, you've died before, and in that moment, you glimpse, you glimpse the mists that surround Atreus's river Skiff. These are just some really cool background and inspiration stuff that I really love that they've included in here as a reason why your character might be religious and might actually be really invested in this god and for the piety system. Um... um I really like the uh, I really like the thing in the top that Atreus often seeks the descendants of those who impressed them during their journey to the underworld. Uh, it's a personal uh, favorite line for me. Uh, but um, the next section is the devotion, uh, and this is uh, in many ways a similar um, similar to your is it the ideal uh, section of your background? It seems like this is just you can take this ideal instead of your background ideal, or I suppose both ideals uh, if you want to kind of mix and match a little bit. Um, but there are some ideals for each god. Uh, some of the ones for Atreus include a devotion. My devotion to my god is more important than what he stands for. Uh, tradition, honor the dead through rites of respect and by continuing their ways, which would be a, a, a more lawful alignment, or dread. Mortals put their fear out of mind, but through me they will remember the inevitable. Um, 
that's a, a much grimmer one and obviously for a more evil character or a, a neutral character it recommends. But um, just some cool ideas about how you can make a character that believes in death. And a lot of these are non-evil alignments, which I think it's great that they're giving a lot of examples for this inherently evil god of how you could play a good or more non-evil character that believes in the tenets of Atreus. Um, these are yeah. consistent for and, all and the gods in Oh, and outside of the Thero setting, if you were playing in the Forgotten Realms, for example, uh, which is kind of the most common 5th edition D&D setting, honestly, you can still look at all of these different ideals for all these different gods, and it doesn't matter if you're worshipping, like, a Forge cleric, right? And that's kind of your, your character, your Forge cleric of Moradin in the Forgotten Realms. You know, you might have this, like judgment right violations against the order of life and death must be set lot right maybe that's like something that you decide is important to your character just because you think it's cool even though that has nothing really to do about more and maybe like the concept of judgment does but i'm just saying you know these tenets are specific for athreos and may not necessarily be directly applicable um to an any other death god um but i think for the most part they are like there's definitely some yeah, that mostly. aren't but like mostly sorry, you can is a use bad example because these all are <laughs> yeah this is these are really good there's some that are pretty specific um and yeah. i think most of them though are pretty general and you could use for any god and i think the, it's, it's interesting because we're starting with atheos because he's first alphabetically but i think atheos is one of the best examples of the pd system yeah. done right and uh, that's going to be really focused on when we see earning and losing piety uh, which is this next section, which talks about how um, a character can earn or lose their piety with Atheos. And the core concept is if you, you increase your piety score when you honor him or the cycle of life and death through acts such as these. And it provides you three very clear examples, providing coins and overseeing burial rites for the slain during a tragedy. The coins thing is something specific to that god's lore, but like... It's a very clear thing a character can do to like show their pious about Atreus. Ensuring the deeds and knowledge of someone who has died are preserved. You know, that's very clear death and the transition of life and death. Uh, slaying a returned or associated idol on. So that's killing undead, right? That have escaped the, the underworld or uh, afterlife. And those are very clear, generally applicable things. Um, and also some... Yeah, other side of the coin. Um, you could lose piety by um, denying a dying person their final rights, removing wealth from a corpse or defiling a tomb, or aiding those who seek to escape from the underworld or who already have. Uh, again, concrete, one of them a lot more setting specific in the third one, like the third one the first time, and the other two things that I think are actually pretty common adventurer's fodder. Um, Absolutely. Now, keep in mind, the game is expecting you, right, to be able to increase your PD by one every session. So these are some examples, right? But, I mean, I could see this being very easily extended, right, to like, let's say you're traveling through a forest, right? And uh, you, the hunter, the ranger is like, I'm going to go hunting. And you're like, I will go with the ranger and make sure that any animals that they hunt are swiftly put to death so that they don't, you know, they don't have to suffer. Right, boom, gain your pee, done. Right, like, even though it's not animals, it's still the transition of, like, life and death. And so that can, like, that's a really cool way to, like, that's not just within these, these examples. But it, I like that it gives you these examples, too. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the conflict, I think, between this and the opening statement, because this is, I think, the first time we're going to be looking at that, which was that you should generally gain one piety a day, uh, but the earning and losing piety system very much implies that unless you do something um, actively proactive and yeah. in the doctrine of your god, that is how you gain piety. Um, it implies that, I, I guess the implication there is as a dun dungeon master, you should be providing... Um, situations in which the player can do these things uh, in every game would be the way to interpret it in the most optimistic way, uh, the most generous way. Um, but it does not say that explicitly. And there's definitely some confusion to me. Like, I don't see this as 
yeah. like these three examples as things that would come up every time. I totally agree. And that's kind of why I wanted to bring up that example of like, right, a hunter going off in the woods. It's, these are exactly that. They're examples. You gain beauty whenever you honor him or the cycle of life and death. So if you can find a way in a game for your character to do those things, like let's say uh, your character, right? Um, I don't know, says a prayer, uh, right? In honor of their family that was killed by orcs. If you're the classic Dungeons and Dragons character, right? You're honoring Aethrius, right? You're honoring that safe passage. And so, that can kind of, I think, could work, right? Yeah. Um, um, it's a weird interpretation. That like a more abstract way of gaining that piety. But I think that's how you, you need to think about it. Because as a dungeon master, you need to be willing to accept those more abstract examples. But um, at least in order to fit their criteria of one point per day or per session. Um, 100%. Uh, 100% agreed. Uh, I, I think the key to dungeon mastering this piety system is just, for me, if a player does something to like remind me that they're the cleric of a god of, or not the cleric, the champion of a god of death in the session at some point, then I would count that as piety. Um, Absolutely. Just um, that's uh, that's something that's going to again come up. These are all very similar. Uh, the way each god is is outlined here. Um, catch up on chat a little bit. Um, I know Vipani and Frosty Pirate were debating a little bit about bonds versus ideals. Um, uh, I would say that, Vipani, uh, you're saying that that sounds more like those ideals that they mentioned sounded more like uh, bonds than ideals. Uh, just by D&D &D definition, an ideal would be just something that is an, an idea or a uh, kind of an abstract concept, and then a bond would be a connection to something. And those are more just like the things mentioned there are just what do you think and what do you stand for as opposed to who or what do you feel attached with you? So that's well, why I'd say that they're close. I would say it doesn't even really matter too much. It's kind of like a semantic difference. The whole point of a bond versus an ideal, it doesn't really matter. It's just that here is some stuff to get you to think a little deeper about your characters, right? If you take two bonds and no ideals or two ideals and no bonds, it doesn't matter. You know, that's not like your character's not like in, invariably broken I, because. Yeah, ideals, bones, and flaws are always just gravy. Yeah. You don't need them. Um, but the just in the gravy. Uh, yeah, they're good. They're, they're good, tasty gravy on French fries. Uh, it's poutine. Uh, love, Atrios. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, go ahead. After you. I was saying, I love purple neko Chinese walls. I lose so much piety from looting all those corpses. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Maybe maybe you don't pick A three S then purple. Um. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about um, the things that you actually get. So you bring yeah. you're accumulating piety, uh, and the game gives you stuff for that. Uh, and as A three S is devotee, the first thing that you get uh, is your life is intertwined with the fate of the dead. When you reach three piety. Um, you can cast Gentle Repose with this trait, requiring no material components, a number of times equal to your Wisdom modifier, minimum of once. You regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Wisdom is your spellcasting ability for this spell. Um, just a very fun, simple trait to start out with that makes you weirdly better at getting piety for Aethrios, which is, I think, cool. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's actually intentional, right? It's yeah. kind of like, well, here's a way that you can do it a little more often. Um, I, like, I like that a lot. Um, at 10th level, the, oh, I'm sorry, not 10th level, at Piety 10 plus, you can cast Speak with Dead with this trait, requiring no material components. And once you cast a spell this way, you can't do so again until you finish a long rest. And Wisdom is your spellcasting ability for this spell. Pretty cool. I really like that a lot, actually. That's so fitting. Yeah. Um, and, and I like that these features, they're not crazy powerful for the most parts. Uh, for the most part. Um, I mean, the, I guess you could say the capstone features are, are pretty powerful. Uh, but, um, yeah, I don't know. The Speak with Dead one is very, very fun, and it makes you feel more of a connection with this god of death. Like, if you're playing a fighter that's a champion, you don't really have any way to interact with the god of death, maybe other than killing people. Um, so getting, like, a, just a simple spell like that can really make you feel a lot more of a connection to the character. I, I think that's going to be true throughout. Um, 
Uh, Eighth Rose's Disciple is the 25 plus piety. Uh, they all follow this 310, 25, 50 uh, chain. You can cast False Life with this trait, requiring no material components. When you do so, you gain an additional 25 temporary hit points. Uh, once you cast the spell in this way, you can't do so again until you finish a long rest. Wisdom is your spell casting ability for it. Um, you just get a big temporary hit point chunk. That one's actually pretty good. That was just a good yeah, one. and then at uh, at Piety 50 plus, you gain either a, pl uh, a blue blue. You can increase your intelligence or wisdom score by two, and that also increases your maximum for that score, which is very, very cool. Uh, all of them have that kind of capstone vibe to them. Um, Pete, what do you feel about this Atreus one? Um, specifically about this Atreus yeah. one? Um, I think it's great. I think it's just the right amount of power for piety. Um, I totally the, agree. The, 20, um, the 25 one is just a little bit like boring to me. Just a big chunk of temporary hit points doesn't really excite me as a player, but mm -hmm. I don't like, I wouldn't go so far to say I dislike it. Uh, and the other three, I mean, all of them have the same champion uh, in, in wisdom score increase or whatever the ability score increase is. Um, the other first two are great. I don't know. I like this one a lot. I agree. And when I read this, because this is the first one I read alphabetically, first of the list, I was so excited reading this. I was like, oh my god, the PD system is amazing. This is very cool. And Frosty Pirate and Chad have the same exact set of incited. I love systems that exist to support role playing instead of character power, which this does so far. It's wonderful. And then I spoke too soon. I guess it's a good reward for role play. It's still okay. I'm talking about the 25 temp hit points. Um, yeah. And. I will say, you know, some of them have that, like, really RP-focused, like, you know, it does have mechanical power. Obviously, Gentle Repose and Speak with Dead, those have mechanical uses. Um, those are good abilities to have. But the real thing about them, right, is, like, they're super fitting. And beyond that, they don't make you any really stronger, I don't think, right? They just make it more fun to play your character that has this c communion with death, or the passage of life and death. And unfortunately, if we start going through these, some of them are just, you're just stronger, which that's a problem I, I kind of have. Um, why don't we move on to the next one we can talk over yeah, there? Yeah. Um, it's already, we've already been going for 45 minutes, Jeremy. <laughs> Uh, so we're, yeah. we're going slow. We're going to have to move a little quicker through some of these. Uh, yeah, do you have any specific can... ones um, that you like or you wanted to do? Well, I just want to give some folks an idea of what the other examples of PD system are, you know, in practice. So, like, Afara here is the god of the polis, basically founder of civilization. They're all about city, civilization, human progress, and the justice of law. And, you know, we, we scroll down through some of their, they've got all this stuff about their relations to the other gods and everything, and they have this right up for everything, if you're really interested in just borrowing this pantheon for your own games. But when we get down to the actual mechanics, right, what do you get for piety? Well, um, earning and losing piety. Defending a city from a major threat, <laughs> defeating a tyrant who threatens the city's freedom, creating a masterwork such as a building or a poem. <laughs> um, that How is. Uh, get one of those every time, man. That's. That's a much bigger one. <laughs> yeah. That's. Um, like, yeah. I think kind of conflicts a little bit with some of their concept of of plus one each time. Um, a masterwork is the go-to, says Blood Deuce. Just every day, I want to roll to uh, make a new <laughs> pair of shoes. It's a masterwork. <laughs> well, and uh, I think, right, that's like... But it's, yeah, it's not great when you have to kind of start thinking of it in that way. Like, all right, every day I have to make a masterwork. Like, that's not something that I feel like an adventurer, that would be the mindset of an adventurer. It sounds like the mindset of an NPC that lives in a city. Yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely see this as a very challenging, like, just with the concept, right, of city and civilization. And um, I think, like, if you're doing the opposite of some of these, right, like... Well, the one that I, I really know. like that shows it the most to me is willfully breaking just laws for personal gain. That's the most simple one here, and I feel like they should have had one in the first half that was... That's the same. Um, 
supporting just laws. Uh, yep. Like, just follow, basically following the law and telling people who aren't following the law to do so would be a way to earn piety with uh, Ephara. Um, so, again, a lot of these are going to have to be GM discretioned and, and figured out how you want to make this work. Uh, but they definitely went a little too big on those, even though they're really yeah. cool. Like, I appreciate what they were going for here, but, like, you know, they could have said defending a city from a major threat plus five piety for that. And I think it may have been better if they had gone in that direction. And maybe that's something to consider if you're running piety, the system as a GM, how you would homebrew it or house rule it is, okay, maybe, like, for these ones that are kind of hard, you get more piety when you do them. But for the ones that are really easy, it's just one maybe i don't know um anyway let's talk about what they what they actually get uh this I one's another say, actually really good one quick comment from grogan uh praying to your specific god each day would be a way to gain plus one piety in an acceptable way uh yeah i think that's the minimum Perhaps, like i yeah. feel like there's gonna be a lot of parties that just do it that way as long as you once per day you say you pray your gm will give you the piety which isn't as cool but it is a way to like make it work if if you're not sure how to make it work i, I think it's a, an acceptable idea and after, I think after has a great point here, after uh, after 232 in chat, I really like to slash write haikus for Fara slash to get some piety. Uh, yeah, right. Like, if you're a player that actually thinks that's, like, going to be a fun and engaging thing for you to do, maybe it's, like, as your bard or something, awesome. If you're not that kind of player, that sounds like a nightmare to you, probably. <laughs> you know? It's like, oh, God, I have to go with a haiku every day. Um, like for me, I'd be terrified. Um, but again, this is actually very similar with the moving on to mechanics as what you like. Aphreos gets they get comprehend language at, at P83. They get advantage on persuasion checks at Pi 10. Oh, but only while within a city, which is fine. Uh, and they can re-roll an intelligence check or saving throw once. Uh, at Piety 25 plus, they can cast Warding Kindness Private Sanctum, which is a very cool underutilized spell. I love that. Yep, that's a good one. And, oh my god, sure. after that was a haiku. Holy crap. You gain a piety. I'll give you two. Uh, and uh, Champion of the Polis, you gain Intelligence Charisma. So that's right there, pretty cool. Um, do you want to talk about Erebos a little bit, Pete? Erebos um, is like the evil god of the day. Kind of like Bane. Um, Erebos is the god of death and the underworld, lord of all that has ever lived. He presides over the bit bitterness, envy, and eventual acceptance of those who suffer misfortune. Um, that's his, that's his quick write-up. But yeah, essentially what it comes down to is he's the, um, uh, he's kind he's of the, the guy. villain god. He's the Hades, uh, in the Disney movie Hercules of this setting. Um, or I guess Hades just in mythology in a lot of places. Uh, but... Uh, I know he's characterized, uh, dramatized a bit there, but uh, his thing is that he is the uh, a clerk of the domains, clerks of the domains, death and trickery. Uh, they recommend him for clerics and fighters and rogues and wizards. Um, and um, the way you get uh, Everos's favor, uh, as an example, some of the things on here, um, recovered from a mortal uh, injury, Everos appeared and claimed your service. I like the tonal shift, which it wasn't like, you just have similar ideals. It's like Everos showed up, Erebos showed up and said, you, you are my champion now, you work for me. Um, definitely that, uh, that evil, but to gain piety, uh, which is the, gonna be the core thing we're talking about with these, um, convincing a group of people to accept misfortune, easing someone's death or assisting with funeral arrangements, retrieving a prominent figure's Eidolon, Eidolon or returned form, or thwarting the schemes of Helion, uh, who is the kind of the Zeus uh, of this uh, world, this setting, um, the uh, the god of light, the good uh, exemplar god. Um, but I really love the first one, convincing a group of people to accept misfortune. Um, like, and there's none of these things that I think could be super applicable, like regularly applicable, unless your character's just walking around like, oh, look, a merchant. I smash out the, you know, the wheel of his cart, deal with it, and then I walk away. Plus one piety. <laughs> you've you've pi you've pietized. Um, I, it's just an interesting phrasing of it. Like it almost sounds like the way that they want you to like the way that I interpreted this was almost like. 
a bunch of people have something bad happen to them and you just come up to them and just say, yeah, life sucks. Be, <laughs> be unhappy about it. Uh, and then they all just feel a little sadder and you gain piety. <laughs> now, uh, uh, Blood Deuce is saying uh, that this guy really shouldn't be considered evil. This dude's great. I interpret that as the first one to say, you help people come to term with the misfortunes that befall them. Yeah, I mean, you're right, Blood. With these tenets that you show here, that they're shown here, and these kind of ways of losing and gaining piety, it's not, it doesn't, isn't objectively evil, right? And in a death god in another setting, this could be fine. It's just when you go to all his other write up, he's super evil. Yeah, he, he's, the he's character the is guy. evil. Um, yeah. But you could, of course, play a good cleric of Erebus. Um, Absolutely. Or if you want to just use these tenets and these this piety mechanic on a death god like Kelimvor in the Forgotten Realms that isn't evil, um, or Jorgal or whoever else, um, I can't think of any other death god, but, you, you know, you could do that. And they wouldn't have to be evil and all these tenets would still mostly work. Um, um, Pete, yeah, this uh, is the first one where we break our our piety bonuses. Yeah, um, the other ones. Stuff. Yeah, the other ones he got. They got fun RP tools. Um, this one gets a bane, which is just a good spell, uh, aggressive kind of like battle spell, uh, which I just really dislike the departure from like, like uh, also from a I guess a, a power gamer. I guess the piety system is very much something that's meant not to be power gamed. So I really yeah. don't like the idea, and I guarantee you a lot of people will do it. Will like, oh, I want to worship Erebos because his devotee thing is I get to cast Bane a bunch. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's just a bad choice, um, especially compared to the the first two, which were really fun choices for what the character represents. This one's just you get a cool combat spell. Um, then he gets Vampiric Touch. Um, the uh, the 25 one is when a creature dies within 10 feet of you, you can use a reaction to gain 10 hit points equal to your level. That's uh, actually like an even better version of the false life 10 hit points, I would say. I mean, there's some, you know, argument that can go back and forth, but I think that's better. Uh, and then uh, Connor Wisdom, which, you know, that's the same as all the other ones. So I don't know. This one's just a little too mechanically powerful, but... I mean, I like... I don't think this one's too bad. Like, Bane, it takes an action to cast. You know, it's like a, an ant spell anyway. Vampiric Touch, I think, is just generally not a very good Vampiric spell. Touch, I would almost argue, is a flavor. <laughs> yeah, it's just a flavor spell. I don't think this is, a, like, a problem from a mechanical perspective. It's just the first in a, a series of these that get more and more very mechanically focused. Uh, gamey. And, yeah. yeah, very gamey. Uh, Heliod is the god of the sun. Um, this is a god of justice, of, I'm sorry, of like, of self-righteous justice beyond all else. Yeah. Um, uh, Heliod is the radiant god of the sun. According to Mythian, shares that the sun rises every day and provides warmth and daylight to the world. Um, a god of, of oaths and things like that. And, and we start to go through Heliod's stuff, which, dude, awesome Heliod picture. Very cool looking. I got that card the first time I ever opened a pack of Theros. It was dope. Hot damn. Uh, there's some really cool, like, Heliod favor, right? You were born at noon on the summer solstice, perhaps even in the middle, middle of Heliod's great feast. Uh, you once rescued a pegasus that was trapped in a net, demonstrating your courage and respect for this sacred creature. Some really cool, like, flavor stuff uh, that you could use to, like, why Heliod cares about you as a character. But when we actually get to the earning and losing piety, this is, I think... I mean, it's like the bad paladin. It's like the lawful, yeah. the the things that people complain about about people playing the lawful stupid paladin, um, yeah. carrying out punishment on a fugitive from justice, exacting ve vengeance for a significant wrong done to you. That's the one that's the most rough. Um, and that's the big issue, and we're seeing this here, and we're going to see it more and more. Some of the other gods here, where it's like some of the tenets they recommend you do for this piety system actually encourage you to be a problem player at the table. Like, this one's not too bad, but I know one further on with, like, Stassa, for example. I think it's Stassa. Or Nylea, right? Nylea is god of the, of the wilds, right? Yeah. And Nylea, is one of her decreased piety is you do literally anything to help anyone else, any other god achieve their motives. You lose a piety with Nylea. So yeah, it's, like, it's a little wacky. 
and Lila is all about nature in the wilderness. So it's like if you wanted to be a like a ranger or a druid and you want to be all about nature, and you get punished in piety because you don't fuck over your friend who's the paladin in the party who's trying to do justice or like it's just weird. Uh, I love really weird disconnects. I love on Heliod. I love the down. Uh, I love the downsides on Heliod. Those are, I think, really well done, actually, which is yeah. breaking an explicit promise or oath, violating any just law, or putting others at risk through your own cowardice. Those are great examples. It's just the, the upside ones are a little uh, a little too self-righteous, maybe, <laughs> which is yeah. the tone of the god, but maybe not healthy for a Well, a, and that, a, that's the thing, right? So when we get to some of these more aggressive or, like, abrasive gods, because these gods are abrasive, they're meant to be based on the Greek gods, the piety bonuses and penalties and things, like, they're true to the gods, but maybe they weren't considered super hard in terms of it being a collaborative role-playing game. Because I could see where some of the things in the later gods be can become problems. Um, oh. And this is where Heliod is mechanically very good. You know, you gain the best, the blessed spell uh, with the Heliod devotee, uh, if we thought Bane was bad, the Bless is even better. Yeah, Bless is, like, good. Yeah, it's just one of the better spells. And you get it the number of times you can do Wisdom Modifier. You get Daylight once at 10th level, which is, you know, a, like, a very good spell. Uh, resistance to Fire damage at level tw at 80, 25 plus, And at level 50 plus, you get your ability score Same out. Same as everyone else. Um, so it's like, I, I, I don't know, I feel like with a god of, like, justice and goodness and stuff, why isn't there, like, a... Um, a compelled duel I promise. would have maybe bought into, you know? Where's Zone of Truth? Zone of Truth, great one. Um, like, that, that is the feature to go here. But, uh, or detect evil and good. That's, uh, and that's in the realm. Detect evil sure. and good, we have a Zone of Truth down here at 10 plus. I mean, I, I, Daylight's fine. I'm not concerned with Daylight because it makes sense too, but yeah, I'm just, I'm a little still concerned. Well, you say after you would have liked Compelled Duel. Well, don't worry, we've got a god for you. Uh, Aroas, god of victory. Steadfast god of honor and victory. When soldiers march to battle, his voice is the thunder of their footsteps and the crash of their shields. And, I forgot uh, that we have Compelled Duel. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, I, yeah. actually like I actually like that one. You like what? I like the Compelled Duel choice. Well, but it's so good. His is compelled duel. After you get a second uh, piety because you knew the feature without us even telling you. Um, um, you, you see, I, I feel like the compelled duel isn't as that powerful. That's like works, that, that feature is always so much more worse, Pete. Because compelled duel is a bonus action, so it's just always incredibly good. To just it's just get like a free. It's just like a fun spell though that doesn't get a lot of use. I don't know. I don't mind this one as much, but uh, I can. I get what you're saying. It's just everything here is just so good. Um, anyway, he's uh, he's war he's war god. Um, we won't go into too crazy. Um, and of course, earning and losing piety, achieving a great victory, overcoming great... long odds honorably, defeating a skilled foe in single combat, and winning a feat of great strength or skill. Achieving a great victory, I think, is actually a really good one. Uh, it's just the most vague, like, if you are just like, aha, uh -huh, me, then, then yeah, you get piety for that. Yeah, I guess. It's just weird because, right, like, it's also, if they didn't include defeating a skilled foe in single combat, right, that almost implies that, like... You have the one-on-one. -on -one. Well, I mean, I guess single combat, it, it creates kind of like an arena atmosphere where you think you're just, like, facing off. But I feel like, you know, if you fight a goblin... <laughs> which I guess skilled is, is questionable there. But if you fight a goblin and you're the only one that deals damage to the goblin, I would argue yeah. that that's defeating a sing skilled foe in single combat. But I definitely get the vibe. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I like this one too, personally, but I see Frost, you're saying he likes, likes this guy. I, I like him too, but there's a lot. I don't know. Oh, Some wait, Frosty, what if you kill a goblin by yourself when your party fights everything else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's funny. Um, <laughs> Jinx on Pete. Uh, uh, he, he gets Compelled Duel. Uh, he gets Crusader's Mantle. Uh, that spell's pretty good. Um, um, uh, also gets advantage on Fright Saves, which uh, that one just seems kind of stacked. 
Um, yeah, it's just kind of weird. Um, These are all just really good things then, for the, to get. Yeah, the third one is just like really good. Um, yeah. Creatures can't gain advantage against you. That's really powerful. Yeah. And then strength. So. Yeah, it's just. I think it's weird, right? Because like on a cleric. I, this isn't really that big a deal. Compelled duel, you already have bonus action spells you're going to be casting. You have spells you're going to be casting, right? On a paladin, same kind of deal. You already have spells you're going to be casting. It's on the the fighter who doesn't normally have spells that suddenly has five compelled duels and a crusader's mantle. It's just a little weird. Um, the one, this it's next one is actually the one that's the strangest to me. We're, we're on to Karametra oh, yeah. next, who is a god, uh, a goddess of the hardest. Uh, harvest, uh, and her whole thing is that she does. She likes it when you do things like feeding the starving, or defending farms, or you know, building a temple to her, which is a lot uh, for uh, just earning one piety. But dislikes, um, you know, destroying food sources, starting fires that threaten settlements. Those are a couple examples there. Releasing and scattering domestic animals is a really funny way to lose piety, as Karametra. <laughs> just cow tipping is a way to lose piety of Skyrimetra. Um, but her devotee thing, this one, because I really loved the yeah. idea, I loved this goddess in her aesthetic, and then her devotee thing is that you get spectral plants that wrap around you and give you a plus one AC. It's just so, like, so gamey when it seems like 100% the ability should be, like, you can make a wild field into fertile cropland. Should be the level yeah. three one, like Aethrios's was. You can put souls to rest. Like you or can like do the, the thing. The plant growth spell. You can spend eight hours to cast it as a ritual, right? Like, like, like this one's wacky. Like, or the, create food and water with this trait. You can do one of those a day. That seems like it should have been maybe the first trait. Yeah. And then you never get spectral plants that give you a floating AC for no reason. Like, it just seems like it has nothing to do with the identity of that goddess. And then the, the 25 plus is you can conjure grapes that fill vials and become wine, apparently, instantly, that serve as potions of healing. It's, it's very like, cool. I like that yeah, idea. That one, but I don't mind as much, but... It's just so weird. Um, it, like, I could see that being even the... Th I could see that 25 one being at the third level, honestly. Being at the... <laughs> V-Bunny, spectral plants? I am so confused. V-Bunny, so are we. Uh, Plant growth would have been so nice. Yeah, I'm with you. Anyway, that's a weird one. Uh, I like that all the names for the last ones have names related to the gods, even though it's just, like, your constitution increases. You're the champion of harvests. You have plus two yep. wisdom. <laughs> like... It's such a, it's kind of over thrown there. Uh, do we want to do more of these? I mean, I think uh, there might have been one more I want to just talk about really quickly. Uh, one, I like this one is, Yeah, I just want to talk about Karanos. Karanos is the god of storms and wisdom, which is like a weird mixture. I don't actually know if there's a like easy analog for Karanos in other settings. Um, and he's so some cool. of, he's very cool. Like, you get, you're rewarded for solving a challenging puzzle, smiting the unwise or the foolish, and helping a polis plan, but you're punished for, uh, what is it? <laughs> Willingly subverting or impeding a wise course of action. Yeah. So every, so no D&D &D player will ever get any piety ever. <laughs> But like, but his ideals are very contradictory. Like, Failing to plan appropriately for a challenge. Like, no his ideals are indie foresight, player. fortune favors the prepared, and impatience. Whatever it takes. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, he's a just, he's a cool guy. I like him. I mean, I think he's cool. I, it's weird though, for sure. I agree. And of course, his is probably the most obvious mechanical. You just deal an extra one d six lightning damage once per turn. Like. You can um, re-roll a wisdom or intelligence saving throw whenever you would fail it. Or once once per rest. Right? You have an advantage on initiative. He's just all all power. There's I don't know. Just I would have liked to see a little bit more of the wisdom kind of aspect to that. Um Do you want to talk about any other ones? Yeah, I liked I liked actually the next one, which was Clothis. Oh, uh, I didn't like the mechanics of Clothis, but I liked the um the piety way, the ways that you get piety. Um, defeating a creature that has stepped out of its place. 
Um, I think that's a really good catch-all yeah. monster one that, that's really great to have in there. Like, oh, there's a monstrosity that's bordering on civilization now that he's being dealt with. That's how you earn piety with Clothis. Clothis. Just doing good in the world uh, by like overcoming those kind of things gives you piety with Clothis. So I thought that was a great design. The other ones are, I think are equally good, which are repairing a significant wound dealt to destiny by the gods' ambitions, which sounds grandiose, but I interpret that as, um, you know, dealing with other gods' problems that are, are getting out of line and, and kind of overstepping their bounds. So things like cultists. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and then teaching people about Clothis, her nature, and her return. Uh, great. Boom. Spread the word of your god. Awesome. I think more of them should have that on there. Uh, alternatively, yep. uh, you lose them by undoing a deserved punishment or curse suffered by another creature, willfully destroying a natural wonder, assisting a creature in undermining the natural order, or exploiting destiny. Uh, all three of those things are grander, so it's harder to, it's easier to gain with Clothis than it is to lose. You have to do something kind of worse to lose with Clothis following these systems. I think it's maybe the best design out of all of them um, in the earning and losing piety section. Uh, and then you get the cast command, which is too good. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there's a bunch of other stuff you get, but I think the basic gist of what, what like one of the big takeaways that I think you just nailed right there, Peter, is more deities should have this. And I think that's what the piety system is missing here. It's got a lot of really good stuff, but what it's missing is one set of general things that, hey, if you do this, doesn't matter what your deity is, you're going to gain some piety, right? If you meaningfully educate an NPC about your god, right? Or just talk about your god in character to the other players, right, in a meaningful way, you get your piety, yep. right? Like, I think, I think everything needs that. And maybe there's a couple of others that, like, make a lot of sense as a general, like, all of any god, this is a way to gain piety kind of deal. Um, can I say my single favorite way to gain piety? Yeah. In all of this, last, last point. Uh, it's under Crufix. Uh, Crufix is a... Uh, he's Luke, yeah, knowledge and trickery. Uh, he's a cool god. He's really interesting. I suggest you learned about uh, Crufix. Uh, but he has the coolest way to earn piety, <laughs> which is revealing a critical truth at an important moment. <laughs> it's pretty troll. I love it a lot. Uh, <laughs> which almost like conflicts with selfishly refusing to share information is a bad way of losing piety because it sounds like you're supposed to hold on to your critical truths until they matter. Um, so I don't know, I thought that one was just really funny. Uh, maybe it won't come up that often, but I like the idea of it. Got, it it yeah. got me a bit. It, it got me too. Oh boy. Party of evangelists. Oh God, that's awful. I'm in DM hell. <laughs> uh, that's, but, that's fair. There are a lot of other really good ones here. There's Nilea, God of the Forests. I passed by Mogus, God of Slaughter. Uh, I like Nilea and, a lot. Yeah, and I mean, these are all very, very cool, uh, cool characters, uh, cool domains, basically, for gods and the, the features. But I think the, the big question that we need to answer here, as someone who's, we've read through all of these, and although we've covered, you know, only a handful of them on here, how do we feel the overall implementation is? And is the piety system really useful for campaigns outside of Theros? Because obviously it's going to be fine in Theros. But is this something that's useful, you think, to dungeon masters outside of the game? Or would you just make up your own? Um, if you were going to use this. When you say make up my own, do you mean... If, you, if you're going to have piety as like a reward and a mechanic in your game, would you make up your own system? Or would you riff on this one? I would, absolutely, like I would absolutely riff on this one. I think it's a great system. I like the design. I, I just think that there's some, like, I think that as me and you were speaking about this right now, we we're both talking about the things that we would just homebrew change a little bit. Uh, and I think that the body here is excellent. Uh, and it just needs a little tweaking in some of the details. I totally agree. And I think Pete nailed it with the phrase, we would tweak a little bit. Because none of these are just wholesale bad. Even the the God of Harvest one with the plus one floating AC randomly, I don't know where the hell that comes from, but like, that's not bad. Like that doesn't break the game to have in there, frankly. Um, 
that you, you could totally run with that. I would do something else, like uh, as everybody was saying, maybe entangle once per day or something, or a plant growth spell good, or good something. Goodberry. Goodberry, a great oh, goodberry. Why the fuck's in a goodberry? But yeah. you know, um, even though there are things that we would change about it. Um, like having a more uh, clear-cut set of here's ways everyone can gain their piety. I think it's a really cool system. I think it's very, very usable. And actually, I like reading it inspired me to want to use it in the next game I run. So, like, just very cool. Um, overall, I think a very useful thing, and I'm really glad that they actually included this with the book. Agreed. Um... This is uh, a great step in the direction. Like, this piety system has really sold me on their, like, unlike Ravnica's, what was the name of the, the uh, Renown system? Renown. This one made me, like, excited about the Theros setting, even. Like, I was definitely getting pulled into yeah. the setting with this Pantheon because I thought the system was great. And that's actually another thing. I didn't think I would ever want to play in a Magic the Gathering setting. I could play in this setting. After reading this stuff uh, in this gods and the piety system and how the gods work there's a lot of really great stuff we didn't talk about which is like how worship of the gods manifests for each god and that's yep. such a really cool thing to include a ton of detail in here on that just from like a world building perspective but also as like a, as a player how i would have my character maybe like how my character might follow those or maybe do it differently um or as a dungeon master how a villain might take one of these examples and take it too far, right? And believe they're doing something in service of this god where really it's, you know, it's taken that concept to an extreme where it's now bad. Um, I don't know. There's some very neat stuff that uh, we'll get you great. Me. We'll get you great cloud piety and rock and piety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone can get piety with the great big cloud and god and uh, The way you get piety with god and rock I think is... Are. I, I think the way you get piety with God Mrognan is saying God Mrognan. You have to convert people. It's a pyramid scheme. Okay. Uh, you eat people for the Great Big Cloud one. That's, uh, um, want to take a break? That's one of the many ways. <laughs> yeah, which, there's a lot of ways, uh, as it's been shown, to get piety with the Great Big Cloud. Want to take a break, come back, and then we'll, um, we'll look at some of those magic items and some of those monsters. Absolutely. Guys, we're going to be right back in five minutes, and when we return... We're gonna die. Just gonna repeat what you just said, Pete. We'll see you in a minute. <laughs> 